Good evening. I hope you're very well where you sit and listen or stand and listen or whatever. <laughs> this is a medical cannabis program and it's to do with legal practices and organic growing. So I don't promote any of the big manufacturers and in those types of things. It's just the organic side of it that I really promote and sustainability. And the law, I like to have respect for the law, so um, I won't be doing any undue things or promoting any things like that to do with the law. I hope you respect them too. And today is an open topic. So we have an open topic. And the topic and can be with anything you want related to medical cannabis. So it could be growing, breeding, harvesting, curing, and just safe uses. So stuff like that. So I hope that I can get some suggestions and possibly start on something. Otherwise, you'd be listening to what I want to show you. And not everybody might be happy about that. We'll see, though. It'll be still interesting. I'll show you some of the slides. So you won't just be looking at a little round circle on the screen. Whoops. There you go, that's a bit better. Hello, Lene. G'day, Lene, how are you? It's an open topic, so I'm just waiting to see if anybody's got any suggestions on how they'd want to, the slides that they'd like me to show, instead of me just going and picking some out. So if anyone's got anything, they are more than welcome. Otherwise, I might just get into... Uh, all right, I'm going to start. And I'm going to title, what, what can be today's? Why don't we just go through one of the courses? That's a good background in general. Instead of studying, sticking on plants so and soil science and microbiology, Slides, share screen. Um, wrong button. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Doing okay, thanks. Hope you're doing well too. Yes, doing very well, thank you. Just waiting for any topics. Same with you, Jimmu Sema. There you go, mate. If you've got any topics, I'm just about to start and I was going to show some, uh, talk about one of the courses that I've done related to plant soil science and microbiology. Instead of just focusing on one of those topics in, in general, I'm just going to get into it that way. Unless the people listening want to steer me some way, I don't mind. I'll show some slides towards that. But at the moment, I think I'm going to get into it. And then you can maybe, yeah, that's a good idea. Then you can suggest which course possibly you'd like me to elaborate that. Nanotechnology and agriculture was fantastic. These are all the different related courses for plant soil science and microbiology. Entrepreneurship was good too. And that's related because you have to start different areas that haven't been invested into so to fund yourself it's very hard so it's good to get help um what's what's good nanotechnology and agriculture i really like that one uh, organic farming that was very good actually organic farming let's go through that one did you know there was uh 800 and 30 odd people in the class, and I got in the top 5%. Because I got a, a little topper thing from the university. All right, so organic farming. So this will promote all the good, healthy ways to do it and how to make your substrates and things like that. Water requirements. No, well, you know, you know about water requirements for cannabis. If it's going to sag or droop, that means you've reached your permanent wilting point and 
that's not good because at that stage you've start things have started to dry up it's started to release abscisic acid and things to go going into drought mode so you want to water just a little bit before that and field capacity is the other end of the spectrum when it's running off that's at the yes so that's the two ends so you want to stay in the middle actually this might go into oh no, micro irrigation engineering went into more of it that was a course where it was just on that micro irrigation engineering and it studied on root balls and you could see from different drip techniques or different irrigation techniques to how the root balls grow differently so pretty cool but yeah for this one <clears throat> oh yeah i'll just have a look at chat on the other thing more g'day ned kelly how you going mate Dave, 969, good morning to you, good evening. Main Green Grower, how you going over there in the freezing land? Death Bubba going out again this year. Well done, mate. Yes, you did very well last year. I hope you do well with Pink Death Bubba too. I'll be keen to see those ones. I reckon Pink DB is a bit better than DB. Anyway, so you, you let me know. Um, today, this is just, I'm just going to go through this organic farming and sustainability in agriculture course because there wasn't anybody really steering me in any questions. So the good properties of quality compost. So good and bad on the right-hand side. So if it's really good, you've got a carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is balanced. So that means that if it's too low, it's going to, the microbes will use all of the elements in there if it makes it too fast. So if you've got too high of a nitrogen ratio, that's what happens in that. And if it's too low in the process um, to at the opposite end, too high in carbon, the breakdown process will be too slow. So that's why you want to have it in between 10 to 20. And a good quality compost, okay. Um, oh, this must be to finish at, at the end of it, okay. Because you want it, when you're making it, you want it to get into the thermophilic stage about 65C or 150, 170 Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's at the end because moisture, because the moisture of growing or active compost is 60 to 80 percent you want to pick it up squeeze it and it always has to have drips coming out of it and that's the end result of it the real goodness <laughs> the dark actually it's not all dark remember because remember humic humic substances are made up of the humic acid and fulvic acid and humin and they all go on the different the darker color is the humin h-u-m-i-n and the fulvic acid was the light brown colour like uh, urine. And nitrogen, everything needs nitrogen. Earthworms. So you want to have good earthworms, yes. There's three different types, epigeic, endogeic, and anic species. The anic ones, they eat worm castings, and they're the ones that burrow vertically up and down, so you don't want them. You want the ones, the epis. The epis means it's on top in Latin, and geoic means earth in Latin. And endo means inside. So the endo ones, that means they're just inside of it. They mostly stay inside there, inside the Mother Earth. Uh, water characteristics of compost. So you can see the different carbon to nitrogen ratios. So below 19, carbon to nitrogen ratio, it's animal manure, bag waste, and it's most suitable with a high nitrogen content. But you really want moderately suitable moderately suitable and then less suitable if it's really high because yeah if it's too high like that it won't break down too fast and too low it will oh, i've already said that <laughs> this is just different ratios and what happens at different ratios water height uh, like this is hang on I'm, uh, okay I'm sort of skipping ahead a bit it's not really taking any structure, these slides. Why not? Let's start lecture 10. Ah, oh, that's why. They're not supposed to go from the other end. These are all the different things it covers. All these PDFs. Um, pests and diseases, vermicompost, organic meat production note. Come with something interesting. Or should I start from which eight? I don't know what else about. I know I'll sort them into a date. Is it the first? Eight, seventh, 
seven, this one. Here we go. Now this should be better. Start again. Oh no. <laughs> Same spot. All right. I'm keeping on going. This is how to make Verma Castings beds. So you can make them in very different ways. I did a pretty good video on the commercially how to do, use your land to do it. It will cost you nothing. Oh, what you need is cows. So if you've got access to good cow manure or if you have cattle, that's the only things that you actually really need because you can see how they've made them here out of bamboo or sticks and they've got other things you can use for the, for the roof. But anyway, you just want to make a covering. Put down a bed and let the action of the worms take over. And look at this. this is a, I love it. The studies I do there in India and they show you how you can do it yourself like this way or you can do it in the North America way and buy it. So I love these options, just if you're not, I'm quite an active person, so I don't mind doing this sort of stuff. Look at that, a fully homemade commercial multi-tier firma casting place. That's so cool. <laughs> multi-tier, yeah. Um, worm propagation. So if you were to make all of those, that's what I go through pretty decently in the video. So this is the different characteristics that you want. Like a mixture that stuff you might put in is green biomass, and that would uh, like leaves and all things that are green, and then the cow dung. So you just want your green manure and your brown manure, and that's it, 50% ratio. It's all you need to get them cranking. Then after 50 to 60 days, it depends on your different seasons and how they're fed and the temperatures, definitely. But usually after probably three months, it's you've got good, very, very enriched, soil that your girls will love and there's some bonuses too about it about the vermicompost because the microorganisms multiplied in the lab they're mixed with organic waste throughout before putting them in the vermi bin <coughs> in, in the vermi beds and the fungus some different funguses you get but there's, well, there's beneficial fungus that are in the vermicompost as well that will proliferate remember soil has Equal healthy soil has an uh, equal amount of pathogens than it does to microbes, but it's because the, everything's in check and healthy that the pathogens haven't got a chance to take over. Oh, I better get back. I'll go back to the chat. Actually, I'll leave it up and read my little thing out. Because uh, I saw Flora Nugs there. There you go, Flora Nugs. I see you, mate. Uh, cheers, all. Woo <laughs> you could grow your weed in there. It looks like a great spot for autos. Yes, autos grow awesome anywhere. <laughs> um, and this just gets into, before it was into the finished compost characteristics, and this is the active compost characteristics. So the moisture is a lot higher, 60 to 80, where if you wring it out, you want to see a few drops coming out of it. And well, you do want it to range. It'll go through different stages, but you do want it to get up into the, if you're putting into your, bins into your compost, seeds or um, possible pathogens or problematic substances, you definitely want to get your temperature up above 65, which is the thermophilic range, and that's going to break down all of those problematic things and the seeds too. So if you get seeds in it, you know that they haven't, and they germinate, you know that they haven't um, gotten up to that thermophilic range. Earthworm separation. If... It's hard. It's blooming hard doing earthworm separation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, bird thinks so as well. <laughs> uh, I found out the easiest way that I did it was tipped it upside down, tote upside down, and then just separated it by hand. And then if you build little pyramids, um, the earthworms always go to the bottom. So then you can scoop off the top, throw it out. No, scoop the top and keep it scoop top, and then you'll get down the bottom, and then you'll see the remaining ones that have gone down the bottom. But these people here, they use sieves because they've got big commercial productions, or this one is a shaker table. So it's just on a little offset bearing and just shakes. And here's kind of my technique, just tip it upside down. Uh, Advantages of organic farming and disadvantages of chemicals. Oh, this is going to get into a pretty fascinating chat. Growth balance differential hypothesis. This is cool. 
Um, I'll look at chat. Uh, Atomic Spoon, how you going, mate? Cheers, legends. Florinots. Uh, cheers, cheers, cheers. G'day, g'day, g'day. So back to this. It's, oh, I see. I've got my little screen thing there. We don't need that, do we? Uh, is that one going? Present. I'm just trying to get rid of. <clears throat> Hopefully, you just see all just the whole slide now. No, it's still on the bottom. I'll try once more. Because that, that's a bit annoying. Oh, that one. <laughs> Last time I'm trying. There we go. Hopefully this works. Supreme Grape. How are you, Supreme Grape? Talking about organic farming and sustainable agricultural practices. Ah, just shifted. Anyway, that's where it is. I'm not trying to fourth. So this slide is the advantages of organic farming and the disadvantages. So some advantages of organic farming is it improves soil health and quality, so you can do it over repetitively. It's the disease and pest resistance it gives to the plants in a better way, so the plants do develop a disease and pest resistance, where chemical they don't because they're bottle fed. So once it gets into that stage and it activates the plant's immune system, it shuts down all the growth, where over here, it's already got just bugs in around, so they activate the pathways that allow the immune system to just be on in the background, and it gives a bit of a resistance. That's the simpler way to put it. And the third advantage of organic farming is recycling of agricultural and aquatic wastes with lower input costs, so it can be on be ongoing. It's awesome. And some disadvantages of chemical farming or bottle feeding it or just giving it your nutes that you buy uh, are erosion and salinity. So salinity is when your PPM would be above uh, 3,000 PPM, I don't like. Yeah, if I had 2,500, I'd go right out. I just got to watch it. This is in my runoff. So, yeah, salinity means there's too many salts. So that's the plants can't breathe is a way to put it because the salinity is too high so you've got to get that down below two and a half thousand or you know you want it to be 1500 at least or something and then the plants have good options to what they want and soil erosion that's outdoors but yeah and the reason that happens is actually i'm looking under frequencies other disadvantages of chemical farming are frequency use of fertilizers and increased production cost of production Yes, environmental pollution and increased global warming. The environmental pollution is because that you use chemicals that the plants don't have a chance to build up their own immune system and with resistances from bugs being around it. And when the bugs do come in, they've got to be sprayed in a chemical situation. And all of that goes into the ground groundwater. And in the USA, because a lot of these courses relate to the USA, uh, it was I think 90, 95%. Pretty much all of the groundwater in USA is polluted with pesticides because it has an end runoff effect. It doesn't break down. Like if you use organic sprays, like I talked about last week, they have a chance to break down and they're only active for 48 hours. Where these the glycosides and all those real bad glyphosate, sorry, they're just putrid. Uh, why enriched vermi castings? This is getting off the track, but all right. I made a pretty good video on this too. If you want to you just add enriched vermicast compost, so you've got all the good stuff of compost, vermicast compost, but you want to enrich it. Like you add a little bit of this and that, add a little bit, of, and it makes it last a little bit longer. So you wouldn't put it in the form of synthetics. You'd add it in the middle like neem cake. So if you think I want my plants to have a bit of a nitrogen boost at the start, neem cakes, uh, five is to three is to two as an NPK. Don't quote me. It's something like that, though. No. Um, so you'd mix it in with your enriched when you're making up your substrate and that would go up a bit if you want to do your maths numbers for it and if you had a bit of a you know or this is a potassium pig this cultivar that I'm going to grow so you might add a little bit of potassium and as just as examples that, that's what this goes on about uh, do you want me to read it 
No, you just want to see cool slides and me to summarize it. Good work. What's this say? Work and work. Fast and create a larger. Yes, why? Because if you enrich it, you're going to be similar to the chemicals, how they feed it. It gives the plant exactly what it needs at the right time because the, these formats, it's mineralized up, it's held up and bound in straw, for instance, or different products, different things. And it has to be broken down by microbes to make these available forms like in nitrogen. It's, uh, there's two forms of nitrogen the plant requires out of its 17 essential elements. And that's ammonium, NH4 and nitrate, NO3. As an example, I'll just get, you can already re read these from talking on the benefits of using enhanced vermicastings. Just gives you better everything. Nutrient enrichment strategies. So this is, oh, there's an ink cake. Look. So if you want to add nitrogen, you put in an ink cake and it would go up 5.2%. That's when you do it as maths. So these are different things that you could add organically to boost your mineral elements in certain areas. I'm not going to read all them. You can just go back and just pause it. So enrichment of vermicastings can be done in two ways. You can addition of rock minerals during composting process, or you can need addition of rock minerals when it's ready to compost, like when you're mixing up your sunscrape. I like to do it when it's in the ready. I don't want all my worms and bugs breaking down all these things and using these elements for themselves. I want them to be more available to the plant. So I want them to use what they have in the, in the composting. And then I want the stuff that I add, the neem cake, what else do I add? Uh, hoof and wool meal. I use um, oh, langdonite. What's the other one? And guano from my phosphorus. So you can go and add those things at different at the different stages. That's what that's saying. How to prepare it. So if you want to do a bit of a brew, these are you put in your benefits beneficials as well. So when you're making up your things, like if you want to do a tea, you put your beneficials in, like I did. Uh, yeah, look at that. And the other way is you can do it when you're mixing up your substrate. If you when you're mixing that, you'll add your beneficials at that stage. Trichoderma, I was talking a bit about that last week, beneficial fungi, and the azos, they're nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They're rad, I use the azos. Uh, I don't use polymixer, bacillus polymixer, or the firmus. So that's a phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. So if you've got uh, phosphorus in the substrate that's bound up, you'll put in bacillus polymixer, and then that will turn it down, and the end product will be phosphorus ready for the plant. And that is... H2PO4 minus with phosphorus. Remember, there's a few different uh, pHs that it varies at, but the one we want is the H2PO4 minus. Yes, mix of the above. All right, I'll do it. Next, I should see if there's any questions. I'll flip over. No, not much. Everyone's. <coughs> The effect of different organic wastes on my, and microbial and oculants on organic carbon and nitrogen compost, vermicompost. So this is over here. You can see it's the CL is no inoculation at all. And then it's got your trichod trichoderma, azos, bacillus polymixer, and then your bacillus firmus, and then there's a blend of all of them together. And then this is the average. So you can go over here and you can see in the water hyacinth, this is the substrates that they use. Uh, this is paddy straw and SD sawdust. <coughs> so you can see the different ranges of organic carbon obtained by using these different ages, different um, mixes. So you would expect for nitrogen, this one, azos is the greatest. Oh, hang on, mix. Oh, the mix, see the mix. So they were symbiotic and they end up working better than just the azos. So that's interesting. When you go with symbiosis, things different things happen. And this is an example of it. Uh, okay, um, all right, I'm doing that. Eh? What does it show? I think it was a pretty good point. What's this? Oh, this is testing phosphorus. So you'd expect over here the phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, which is a polymixer, 
So that's going to go up. Uh, it should all be at highest, 8.8. 8. Yeah, 9.5, 10 mixed. Yeah, it's another example. I'm not going to go on about everything else. So this is the effect of rock mineral doses on biochemical properties of vermicompost. So the effect of rock mineral doses. So if you had your vermicompost, you'd go and put it in. If you're going to put it in, remember there's two stages when you can add it, at the composting stage and then afterwards. So they'd put it at the internal stages and that had urease activity. And remember the A's at the end of it, words, is means enzyme. And then so ure, urea. So that's the breakdown of the nitrogen, uh, acid phosphorus, what's that really show that? The effect of biochemical sort of stays about the same, goes down at the end. Let's get something interesting happening. Changes in available MPK vermicose during storage. Um, <clears throat> yeah. What's it showing? The days, 120 days, and three months. I think it only had a shelf life of three. 90 to 105 days comes to memory. But that all sort of goes up a bit. So I'm not going to try and interpret that. The take home message is uh, combined applications of microbial inoculants work well, but you don't know which combination. So that's why they did that little test. Um, the effective shelf life of vermicompost is a period of 90 to 105 days. Storage for longer period above 105 days reduces the microbial activity and the nutrient availability. <clears throat> so that means if it's stored, if it's going above that, microbes have gone and eaten back and broken down some of your vermicastings to use for their survival. Quality criteria of vermicompost. So there's three different types. Physical, biological, and chemical. That's the same as soil, actually, too. That's, soil has physical, biological, and chemical. Bulk dense, oh, it looks like it's, it actually is the three things of soil. <laughs> Quality criteria, vermicompost. Um, yeah, it's got a really high CEC, cation exchange. I went through that a while ago, a couple of weeks ago. Acidity is always balanced because of the buffering that you get from your organics. So that's always usually pretty good. Moisture you want it at about 30%. Similar memory compost before was a 25 to 30%, I think. Pore space, you want it high. So because of all of the aeration and the microaggregates that are made up by the bacteria and fungi and the other microbes that are in there, they, well, bacteria, for instance, they put out a biosome and in that biosome, biofilm, it's a substance that binds things together. So, and what that does is it creates a little colony for them. So it's like their little home. So that's what you'll see. So it aggregates up. So that's why you get a lot more pore space in vermicastings. Organic carbon, good. The EC, your solubility, nitrogen. Okay, very good. Comparison between conventional vermicastings and enriched vermicastings. So the enriched ones, just by or adding all those different things that you can before, it just gives it a bit more of a bonus to summarise all this. Because there's a lot in this one. Typical signs of pest and, and disease incidents. I remember seeing this uh, a few weeks ago. Pesticide dependence on small holding vegetable farmers, dependence. Uh, these are just different effects that you get from using pesticides, but I don't promote use of pesticides one single bit. Use biopesticides, ones that break down, work with the plant, three levels. So I went through that pretty good. Not pesticides, neem. That's right, that's where I stopped. It was a neem, I remember now. Neem applications. All around the world, that's what it's called. That's right, not in Canada, sorry. Not anymore. 
Um, let's see how to do that. Seed treatments. Nope. Precautions of using plant extracts. Oh, here we go. What's this? Land preparation. Practicing conservation tillage. So, yes, that's the cool. Even um, some of the tractors that they have over in India, they use moped bikes. You know, those little scooters? And they make these fancy looking um, trailer systems where it's hooked up to it. It's so snazzy. These little tiny things making a little tiny imprint. Big, you know, you could put fatter tyres on it because you don't want to bulk, you know, compact the soil. You want the aeration. Aeration. <laughs> Planting techniques, no, not going into that. Nutrient efficient. Nutrient management. Nutrient management. Nutrient use management. Nutrient use efficiency. Is it what it's called? Nutrient use efficiency. Yes. Because these are the elements, 17 required elements for a plant. CHO, which all come from the atmosphere, which makes up 95% of the plant's nutrient requirements. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. 45% of those two, 5% hydrogen. And then your NPK, calmaic sulfur. That's the other portions down there. And it goes down in little ratios, like it's 1.5%. 1.5% nitrogen, and then it's 1% potassium uh, phosphorus. Actually, I think calcium is above that one. But anyway, and it's just, it's just so little tiny amount. So meaning that majority of plants get their substances from the air, what they need, their form of uptake. So it'll be a, that's how the form of the plant gets it. So it'll have the form of CO2 for its carbon. Hydrogen, so water will be how it breaks down and gets its hydrogen. And then for its oxygen, it'll get its oxygen from the roots. And also it'll do a process where it can split water and get the oxygen out of that. And the two requirements for nitrogen are the ammonium and nitrate. So for the H2PA form minus is the one we want because that's, a, that's in the primary, which is in the pH range of, oh, I'm looking at the chart now. It goes, it's just below seven neutral. And then if you go above seven neutral, that's where you go your HP4 two minus. That's the element. So we want this one. So if you want to get a tester, get the H2 PO4 minus tester for your available and your total amounts. That's what you want to test for. And then your potassium um, is K plus, and these are all the same, they don't change. Actually, isn't it calcide? Calcium? Oh yeah, but it's not, it's the same element. That's all your micro elements what it requires. The only the available plants form. So as many different of these available forms, like nitrogen, it's got at least what, half a dozen, probably eight. Um, yeah, I'm not going to try and name them. You know, one or two. You want me to skip on nutrient management? Nutrient use efficiency is very important because you don't want any deficiencies or toxicities, and it's hard to stay in that range. So that's where you get your cool cultivars, get to know them. And the reason why they say that, because some of them are pigs, like Nukin was a nitrogen pig. And then Pink Death Bubba was potassium. It always used to have the little tips, it looks like nitrogen, but the tips were always burnt at the end as well as the nitrogen looking things. So um, yeah, if you get to know it, then you can allow for it at the start by the feeding it from the, no, not feeding it, by the addition of your enriched vermicastings as an example and allowing for other nature to happen. So you can predict it in a sense. Uh, this, I'm not gonna read online. Sorry, nutrient management. This is what the actual elements do or their bonus like calcium is good for cell division and cell walls. Um, and yeah, that's another point, a very good point is that the elements, a lot of them are mobile and there's not many immobile ones, and calcium's an immobile element. So the only time that you'll see any deficiencies of calcium is in the new growth, because it's not mobile. So it gets put there from the phloem and through its processes, and then it won't be able to be relocated to another part of the plant. So that's why you only see calcium deficiency in the new growth. Recommended nutrient quality. Okay, uh, this is more outdoorsy. You'll get to know your um, nitrogen composition of some organic resources. So this is a pretty good one. 
Because if you're working with organics, you want to know, well, what do I put in? How do I bloom and know? Well, down here, you've got your NPK of your NINK, which is a five is to one is to two, probably. So you'll know, all right, I'll put this in. And this is some other ones. There's a thing called uh, the NPK of everything. And that's got a list of, like your human hair, for instance, that's got a nitrogen ratio of 14. Um, so you can get different things, organic things, and work with them. I'd put a lot of these things like the human hair. You don't want to put that with the plant to think, oh, it's got 14 NPK. 14 is to, it's low. It's 14 is to 3 is to 2 or 14 to 2 is to 1 or something really low. But, yeah, that's an example where I'd add that amendment to the compost process. So I want that to be broken down before because, it, it dead said, it takes our ages to, I have to make it be thin. When I usually do it, <laughs> but I'll, I've been re re recycling my hair because I cut my own hair. So I've been recycling that for, um, oh, gosh, quite a while, many years. Right time in the nutrient application. Yeah, okay. Not really. Well, there's eight growth stages in cannabis, so you've got to know the different growth stages, and then you can work with the plant at those different growth stages to give it what it wants. Like, here's a bit of a brief. Um, seedlings, you always add a little bit less than the seed linked, then it goes seedling, so it'll be under 400 ppm, and once it goes into a, a bit of a plant, you know, you can stick up to your 800,000 ppm, and then you go into flower, and then you've got to ch um, change again. And then halfway through flower, you want to boost it up once it actually gets into the flowering phase after day 21 odd. And then you want to remove your nutrients at least a few weeks before the end of harvest. So those different growth stages are very, very important to know when to give you medical cannabis its best to get the right out of it. And the, and the best thing is at the end, People put so much into the first stages, especially the growing, but not the harvest or the curing. Please do a lot more on that. Or no, I shouldn't say do a lot more, but focus on it. Because um, the crops can be spoiled so quickly, as you know. You know, you get, you've got this rad thing smelling all tasty and yummy on the plant, and then you don't get, you, when you smoke it, it doesn't smell or taste like it. And I consider that a failure. Because what I smell on the plant, you should be breathing it out and getting those same terpene profiles, all very similar. Uh, right method of application, growth regulators. Yep, there are some um, beneficial growth regulators and there's some harmful growth regulators. So a growth regulator might be, here's a mix where you can make your own with um, manure and urine. Look, even a bit of milk. They reckon milk um, helps with powdery mildew. But I don't do the milk thing. I just use fungus resistant genetics for the powdery mildew spray. I'll do for that. Tomatoes. Well, tomato is very similar to cannabis, so you can sort of relate some of its techniques and see if they do work with it. Thrives. Like it doesn't thrive at 10. It wants to be up around the, you know, the mid, mid to high 20s. What's that? The 80 Fahrenheit, 78. Like a pig. No, that's the pigment in it. The red pigment. Uh, the soil. No, I can. Next one. Come on. These organic tomatoes. So you, if you've got you, you know your organic difference. You've got a higher terpene and flavonoid profile, and to, the secondary metabolites will have been activated very heavily. Where the conventional normal, they've got to bottle feed those and try and give them different hormones to get those different um, pathways activated. Where they activate naturally with your organic. What about the growth balance policy? After transplanting to a maturity, pest and disease management. No, nope. I should read chat. I think I'm looking at chat. Oh, yeah. Supreme great, great topic. Oh, good. Good on you. Thanks, mate. Nice to hear some feedback. Disease and pest management. Um, I sort of did that last week. So I'm going to skip that. I didn't go heavily into it, though. Uh, organic tea. Oh, this is, here we go. This is the growth balance differential hypothesis. Well, this is to do with organics and non-organics. And the catagens is the 
and so it is. Catagen is the amount of like goodness in the tea. So they measure the amount of catagens that's in the tea leaves. So you can see down here, just the control one was 14 from the total amount of catagens. And so this is an example of organic to bottle fed, organic, organic. So you can see the outcome. So with an, um, vermicompost and vermi wash, so they fed the leachette back to it, it got a little bit higher. So the secondary metabolites were activated more, vermicompost, and look at chemical, 7.32. So half the amount of secondary metabolites that the um, chemical ones get. So you're still gonna get nice, chunky looking good buds, but um, bag appeal superior with chemical, even probably better, because you get your CO2 range and you know your CO2, which comes from uh, carbon, which is 45% of the nutrient requirements. So that's why you get a little bit more chunky and better bag appeal with the chemical and people want to more so go with it. But if you break down in the secondary metabolite profile, this is what you get. And you'll know if you've, I've done organics for a while, so um, you've, it's just amazing. Instead of having a terpene profile of two or three, two and a half percent, you're getting them up near four and a half, five percent. And it's like, just wow. You open a bag and, you know, the neighbours are sort of coming out the street. What's going on? <laughs> Characteristics of different types of meat. All right, all right. We can skip this one. Organic cattle, really. Yep. You want to make it organic. Quality transition to organic. Why? Because studies of farming practices organically for many years found that the effects of the chemicals are on health, improves health all around human, soil, animal, and the effects of conventional farming on soil and conservation. So sustainability, it has really good, so why transition to organic? Well, sustainability, dissatisfaction with conventional farming practices, decline in family farms and rural communities, opportunity to improve farm profitability, considerations for transitioning. It takes you, yeah, three to five years to convert an organic system. So in that time, you'll do it, but if you can't, most people don't do it because they can't afford it, but you do it, you break down your farm. So you put it into four squares, you'll do one, then that the second year, this the third year, this the fourth year. So you can still get the same yields you were getting, but you're just putting different paddocks under different um, outcomes. Oh, here you go, one field is home. <laughs> what is transition period? It's three to five years, it said before. What do organics sub standards require? It's got to be at least, the land must be managed as organic for 36 months prior to the first organic harvest. And during the last 12 months of this period, it must be under the supervision of organic certification body. I point line, people know, what do organic standards require? I'm actually I'm not going to get into this. Uh, introduction to crop rotation. There's more outdoors. Why rotate crops? Well, you have to, because otherwise everything takes over. You want a change in it, then the microbes change, so there are no pests and things don't take over. Soil fertility complex is in relation to external factors. <laughs> That's good, so you want it right in the middle there if you can. It's hard to get. It keeps the biology heaps of good physical and what was the third characteristic? Good chemical properties. Quality production as a function of crop rotation. Okay, crop selection type. Ranking an annual vegetables based on relative nutrient requirements. All right, ranking an annual balance it. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, you wouldn't really start with these ones because you know you're going to get large deficiencies, but you might put in some of these ones to give a deficiency for any of these ones. Actually, we're talking medical cannabis here. Rooting depth. Sorry about that. Examples of crop. Examples. That. Supposed to be medical. Stay on topic. Outline the integrate farming system. No. The inter oh. Yeah, look how rad this is. This is so cool. I couldn't believe it when I saw this. So you've got your hydroponics on your left, which we all know of. 
Hydro means water, so it's just fed by water. So it's all just water under there. They put heaps of bubblers in it to aerate it. And did you know too, from micro-engineering, engineering, I learned that the more bends that you have, 90 degree bends in your hydroponics, the more dissolved oxygen it reduces. So in subsets, you want it at 20.95%, and that's what the air is. And it found that in some um, large facilities, they were getting it as low as 5%. So the plants uptake their oxygen, mostly the majority of it, through their roots. So if you're limiting that, that's limiting 45% of the growth factor. And remember uh, Levin's limitation of nutrient availability. So whatever is the lowest available nutrient in the 17 beneficials or the 17 requirements, you can only get the best out of it. And over here, this is a fascinating one. Look at that, vertical farming. That's just amazing. And look, it's, it's made of bamboo, which can be scaled up from 10 metres to 80 metres, from 30 feet to 240 feet. <laughs> it's made out of bamboo. And you put a wind turbine on top. That's just fascinating. I love these um, techniques that they do. This one here's got solar panels. The rain comes in, comes down to a reservoir and go back up and feed it all. That's it's just excellent. Aeroponics and hydroponic crops are grown. Aquaponics tank down the bottom, collects all the nutrients from the fish. It's just cool as I really like the way that they teach me. <laughs> uh, that's what we all know about hydroponics. Why hydroponics? Well, it doesn't require soil as the main thing. Everybody uses it. It's the easiest. And you do get faster growth gains because the, there's bubbles in there and those bubbles have a lot of oxygen. And the oxygen is transfer. Um, this. It takes it's 10,000 times slower to get oxygen out of the water than it is to get it out of the air. So if you've got these little bubbles cruising around and bubble, bubble, bubble right next to bursting next to the roots, that's why it grows a lot faster. There's no oxygen limitations. If I zero, pesticides, uh, as if a lot of people do use it because people don't go the organic route. No problems with weeds, that's for sure. Uh, look at this. Can you do organics with hydroponics? Nah. Well, pigs ask. Yes, you can. It's blooming awesome. Look at that. That's filtered tea nutrients they've got running back through their hydroponic system. I've never heard of anybody in cannabis doing that, and I love it. And there's also got one outside, with filtered tea newts doing it outside, just through, you know, a bit of plastic there. You cut holes in this plastic in those 200 mil conduit pipes for the size of your pot. So you go out and buy your small pots, and then cut holes the same size, and they sit in there. And they got clay balls or something like that in there, which the roots can weave themselves through. So your vermicompost has all those bonuses in it. And then your vermiwash has a little bit extra. So they just use filtered tea newts to run this hydroponic organic system. I love it. <laughs> all right, what's chat doing? I'll read that. Oh, that's super nice looking. There's a bit of feedback here and there. It's not terrible, though. Yep, yep. it's very nice. Why vertical farming? <laughs> well, in 2050, 80% of the world population will be in urban centres, meaning there'll be 3 billion, with a B, more people in 2050. So in less than 30 years, there's going to be nearly 50% more people on the planet. About 70% of all fresh water is used in irrigation for traditional agriculture. However, water is going to be limited for future agricultural productions. So also the land. So that's why we need to go vertical. This is a really good option. It's cool. Systems used in vertical farming. Hydroponics, float stems, aquaponics, and aeroponics. Aeroponics is cool. It's your, you just lose a ceramic disc, and it's the ceramic disc, it vibrates, and it transforms little oxygen bubbles into it, and then it's... That's how our aeroponics works, and it puts it into a smoke. So you put it in a really thin layer of water, and it vibrates on top, and it forms into a really thick mist. It's rad. I've done it before in medical cannabis. 
food policy. Oh, here we go. Nutritional policy. So 10 reasons why organic is healthier and more beneficial. Look at that. Secondary metabolites. There are some five, 10,000 secondary metabolites, secondary compounds in plants, which are considered as health promoting and protective and thus necessary for health. There are major four categories. So the phytonutrients, the phenolics, terpenes, alkaloids, and sulfur containing compounds. Actually, there's, there's three, there's only three secondary metabolites. There's, I can show you. Oh, don't worry about it. But yeah, so that's this is just reintegrating why it's a lot better and healthier. Same, this is the same with medical cannabis, it's the same thing. So if you can unlock this profile, secondary metabolic profile before by using your organics and the plant has to work for itself, that's, you're gonna get a lot more benefits out of it. Especially if, you, if you're an extractor, this is a must because the flavonoids and terpene profiles you'll get will be so much different from ones that are chemically grown and bottle fed. Just because you get a bigger yield doesn't mean to say it's more healthier. Some evidence. Comparison of content of nutrients and other nutritionally relevant substances in organically and conventionally produced crops. So yeah, just all these different elements are a lot higher. Oh, hang on, no difference. Well, hang on, better somewhat conventional. Oh, no different. So quite a few things remain the same. But in general, this is that's the nutrient requirements. The secondary metabolites is the things we're really after because we don't grow for nutrients. We grow for secondary metabolites and cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids, three main things for cannabis farmers. Pesticide residues. Well, there won't be any pesticide residues because you won't be spraying because an organic, you can see down here, there's a very low amount. But conventional is huge because they've always got to spray. Some evidence. Yeah, pesticide residues. Yeah, I've sort of explained before. Nutrient bioavailability. Some of the evidence. More for leafy vegetables as well as root vegetables, a trend for higher dry matter contents in organic food stuffs have been found while no significant difference has been identified for fruit vegetables. Okay, let's get back to medical cannabis, storage, storage of must, you already know about post-harvest productions. Comparison in weight gains, cadmium. Cannabis is a bio, a bio, um, a bio accumulator. So if these cadmium CD, if that's put around it, it has a chance where it will take it up. And it usually it stores them in its vacuoles and its edioblasts and different plastids. No, the, no, the edioblasts are plastid and dermal tissue and where the secondary metabolites get stored. But there's still a chance where we can ingest it. So you've got to be careful with what you put in your substrates. You are what you eat. Yes. Reactive oxygen species, ROSs are highly reactive free radicals. They're the things in the body that cause stress, inflammation, add up to poor nutrition. They really don't help. They're the things that give, cause cancers long term. And when you stress out a lot, you produce these superoxides or hydroxyl radicals and they will build up, build up, and that's when you'll have problematic problems down the track. So by producing plants with a lot of antioxidants in it, you've got a chance where they can scavenge and they'll remove these and they, well here, I'll just read this. Scavenge, remove reactive oxygen species before they can damage important biomolecules. They aid in the human body's natural defenses, which include enzymes such as superoxide dismutase, catalase, and glu glutathione peroxidides, oh yeah, peroxidase, and glutathione reductase, it reduces it. Um, and antioxidants also repair oxidative damage and prevent mutations. So by growing with the secondary metabolites and producing more antioxidants, 
That's the health factor. The role of antioxidants are, I don't have to go into that. Well, firstly, I can just three, say three points. First, they inhibit the formation of active oxygen species and free radicals. So that means that they won't grow any of those rosses, any bad things. Secondly, the, ra the radical scavenging antioxidant method, okay, they scavenge them so that they will break them down. And thirdly, by the repair and cleansing of oxidative damaged lipids. So they just repair things, the antioxidants. So if you can grow with them and include that in your plant tissue, this is going to aid you in good health. That's why I really promote organic growing. It might be, it's so much harder, but look at the outcome. Classification of antioxidants. Antioxidants, synthetic or natural, and then you can break synthetic into primary and secondary. And the natural antioxidants are like absorbic acid, ascorbic acid, A-S-C-O-R, beta carotene, and anthocyanins. So see, remember that I made a video on anthocyanins, on how to produce more anthocyanins in your cannabis? It's the techniques that I use are temperature related, and I've got it nailed and dialed in. Some other natural antioxidants are for flavonoids and polyphenols. And what cannabis both has them. Natural antioxidants. Anthocyanins are a type of flavonoids. Oh, okay. <laughs> what else is related? Cannabis related. Common natural antioxidants and their sources. Uh, flavonoids. Ah. You just got to grow, put more into it. That's well, the flavor. That's the flavor profiles. So you, you smell them with the terpenes and the flavor profile, flavonoids. So you get a little taste out of those. They, that's not. That's just a generalizing way. But you're having those such a benefit. Anthocyanins. Here we go. Eat. You get your cannabis plants dark. So once it produces that purpley effect, that means it's building up anthocyanins in its. Uh, what's in there? What sort of tissue is that in there? It's doing it in. Uh, it changes the pigment. The what is it? It's not chlorophyll, but it goes to xanthanol, and then it's then it goes to the anthocyanin. What's the name of that little? Not chlorophyll. Anyway, the little round things in the leaves. Sorry, that's all for that one. Through okay, phytochemicals. Well, phyto comes from the Greek word plant, so plant chemicals. So what other plant chemicals can you get out of it that are beneficial? This is more so for the extractors. So for most of us, we want to consume it through vaping, which I do, and other people use other combustion methods. Hey, yield source, how you going, mate? This is just a general, I'm talking about organic farming and sustainable agriculture. This is a course that I did a while ago. I'm just trying to pick out the topics that are related to uh, cannabis. How do plant chemicals work? So antioxidants. Most plant chemicals have antioxidant activity and protect our cells against oxidative damage and reduce the risk of developing certain types of cancer. Hormonal action. Isoflavins, which I'm pretty sure we do have in cannabis, are found uh, they help human estimate. Oh, reduce menopause, so it's good for females. Isoflavins. In dot, okay, all right, next. Ten year comparison of influence of organic and conventional crop management practices on flavonoids in tomatoes. So the conventional, they were lower in that type, the flavonoid, lower in the next, and lower in, so it's nearly 50%. So over a 10-year period, you're getting, you could say, nearly 50% more benefits out of the these types of flavonoids. What is antioxidant capacity? That's known as oxygen radical absorbance capacity. That's to do with, well, actually, we could put this back into cannabis because you want to know your antioxidant capacity, how much antioxidants you can put in there. This hasn't really been talked about. How do we measure that? Measuring... ORAC allows us to compare. Yeah, it does. The food's higher in ORAC, yeah. That's, yeah. The food's higher in ORAC scale 
more effectively to neutralize free radicals. So we want to measure ORAC. Okay, I'd like to do that with my cannabis. Antioxidant functions. Uh, no, I'm not going into that detail. It's pretty good detail, isn't it? Determining antioxidant capacity. Uh, when only the antioxidant capacity value are available for a particular food, no, in fact, no. ORAC in some fruits. Yes, well, this is all particular with the grown too, because if they haven't grown organically, these numbers would be a lot lower because I won't have as much antioxidant capacity in it. Comparison between organic and inorganic vegetables for antioxidant capacity content, sorry. Bioactive substance and key results. Higher in organics, higher in organics. So one, two, three, four, five, six out of nine or 10 were all higher. So it's a 60% improvement in the antioxidant contents of organics over inorganics. The yield of total phenol of tea. Phenols, isn't phenols like catechins? Uh, phenol content, total collagen content. No, they're different. <laughs> well, it would have went up. This is um, this whole group is just summarising difference between chemical and organics, the outcomes of what it does on the quality of your of the cannabis of the produce for this. Hey, we are finally. I'll say good day to chat and I can go on about the growth balance differential hypothesis. See, number two, awesome. CLC, what's the one they say? The higher the RAC, the better. Yes, that's for sure. We need our cannabis like that. Hey, we need to test it. Genetic memory file, it's nice to see you, mate. Good evening. I hope you all are safe and very happy. Very good. Yo, um, this is a also a comparison to do with organics conventional. That's how the title of the show can, today can be. Organics comparison to conventional growing. Because this there's two real good theories here. The one was oxidative stress, whereas I've just pretty much described about all of the antioxidant potential. And then the second is the growth balance differential, the growth differential balance hypothesis. Oh, I see that in the wrong way. I pretty much know it's a great balance differential hypothesis. Yeah, look at this trends, trends in plant science. It um, just shows from the plant having to work for itself, it defends itself. Where if it's bottle fed, it's not defending itself. It's like, gimme, 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 and then it's going, oh, what do I do now? There's all these bugs around me. I'm just going to throw deficiencies and twist my leaves. And the grower goes, shit, we better spray it and help it. So that's the difference. Then the growth balance differential hypothesis, it's, it's cool. It states that in high nutrient environments, such as conditions on conventional farms where synthetic fertilizers are used, plants will spend their resources creating new plant tissue rather than secondary metabolites. So that's why you get a higher yield, but in organics you'll get a higher secondary metabolite production and this has proved a lot that's why I'd much rather get a smidgen yes yield and get heaps more secondary metabolites so my stuff stanky it's so much beneficial in many ways that's why when people say can I have some kind of no sorry grow your own rabbits another uh, hypothesis point says that in less rich conditions, growth is limited by the lack of nutrients. So more resources will be available to be spent on secondary metabolites. And thus, as nutrient levels decrease from high to immediate, antioxidant levels actually increase. See? So you're going to get so much benefits. So it really does pay off to try and do organic practices even though it's going to get harder, but you'll get easier in the long run if you keep these good, sustainable practices going so you can reuse everything. If you, because by reusing everything, you'll be putting everything, so you, you'll put all these beneficials back into substrates and then you'll reuse that. And then you'll find, wow, 
they've already been inoculated already. So if you do a like pull a plate, um, do a a petri dish and put a swab onto a petri dish, do a a little a drawing that you do, and um, you'll find that you'll get the ones that you've already inoculated from a few grows ago. So that's really really cool. Uh, and another few points: the highest level of antioxidants are found in environments with immediate levels of nutrients. So intermediate, intermediate levels of nutrients. So I see on this chart over here, so it's showing that's intermediate. So this is to do with their amount of plant secondary metabolites, the oxygen, antioxidant level on the sides here. So you really want it high. So by bottle feeding it, you're gonna get it low. And if you feed it too much, high nutrient levels, like those found on conventional Farms will result in low as well. Yes. So you want the plant to put up with it. It's got to work for itself. Uh, very low, very low levels of nutrients will also result in low levels of antioxidants. Because of there will be not enough resources for creating secondary metabolites, nor plant growth. So the plants, because you're bottle feeding it, it's just putting the rad NPKs and growing with hollow interiors of the stems. That means that it's growing too fast. So you're reducing in your secondary metabolites and antioxidants. So their intermediate nutrient conditions are similar to those found on organic farms, while the high nutrient conditions are found on conventional farms. So concluding, the intermediate nutrient levels on organic farms should result in crops with higher antioxidant production and secondary metabolite production than crops grown on conventional farms with high nutrient levels. So that was really cool, I love that. That's just so, it pretty much sums it up why putting up with all the organic practices pays off. Because in general, if you're using it as health, as a health thing, this is nearly just a second nature you've got to do. And I get so much health benefits out of it, so that's why I want to try and get my genetic potential. Right oh, next. How long has it been going for? What says it now? I get carried away with this organic stuff. It's rad, isn't it? Pesticide residues. Yes, ah, oh, that might say about the US. What I was talking about before, how all the pesticides, components of residues in human breast milk. Oh my. <laughs> uh See, it just travels everywhere. That's the reason why it's in the breast milk is because the cows ate the grass and the grass had pesticides on it. So it went in, went through the chain and the food chain, just like the nanoparticles, it goes up the food chain as well, nanoplastics. Bioaccumulator, be careful what you feed your, your microbes, mineral fertilizers and supplementary nutrients. We control. Mulches, yes, been through that. Setting up considerations. All right, marketing strategy. Look like the end of the the end of the show. It is, I think. Is there any questions that we got on today? I know it was a bit of a slow one in chat, but yes. Is there anything that anyone would like me to show? Because this has been going for a while now. What's it been going for? There's a little ticker. Uh, an hour and eight. Yeah, cool. Cool. Oh. All right. Well, I think today was a pretty good one. I can go back and relabel it, I think, to a difference between organic growing and conventional growing and the benefits that you'll get out of it that was perfect. <laughs> I think it was summed up nicely. I'll just wait. We've got a 30 second delay between now and when it comes out to hear on your ears for these lives. So I'll just give it a smidgen just in case there's any people want to ask any questions. And next week, they'll be the same again. It'll just be an open topic. I think today's open topic was pretty cool though. It works out well. Uh, so if you've got any other 
medical cannabis questions. We can discuss them next week. Hmm. Uh, F Medical, how are you, mate? Nice to see you. Oh, right at the end. F Medical says, what types of mould affect cannabis flowers? You've got botrytis, which is your grey mould, and you've got powdery mildew, which is on top of the leaves, which is a whitish mould, and then you've got uh, downy mildew, which is under the leaves, and it's not real... There's not much of that, really. So more so on cannabis, it'll be botrytis. That's the grey mould, and it looks terrible, and there's not much you can do about it. If you get it, you uh, probably, if you do get it, a good way to get rid of it would be to go back and veg the plant and then you can reflower it. That's about the only way because those buds are useless. You can't extract nothing out of it. You can't, because um, you'll be extracting the mycotoxins out of the, the fungal spores as well. You can't smoke them. You can't irradiate it like they say that licensed producers do because it still has a little bit of it in there. So you'd be still getting the effects of it. Uh, pretty much it's, it's not good. I use fungal resistant genetics. Um, it's, it just pays off, mate. It's, I hope that helped. Fratel, medical. Oh, it's genial. What's the one I say? Sorry. I've been attending to my car in the background, been listening. No, that's okay. I hope, hope some of this has been helping in, in the garden. <laughs> Genetic memory farms. I've seen black mold as well on rare occasions with buds that are way too dense. Yes, yuck. Yes, that's very good. Oh, Fratrell says, is the botrytis just decomposing the buds? Yes, mate, it sure is. What it does, it's, it, it pills, puts out a film like a slime stuff and it's what it wants to do. It's got to grab its nutrients. So with fungi to work, they've got to put out an enzymes that break things down and then that's how they feed off them. Uh, so, yeah, that's not good. I, I think, but one thing that you can help is the moisture level because you will not get botrytis with humidity above, or, sorry, if the humidity goes above about, I reckon 70%. But I, I stress when it's 65%. If you get humidity above that for long periods of time, for more than four or six hours, in other words, outdoors, early in the morning when the dew comes in, you're in a bit of strife because if there's any spores, the tritus spores in that area, they are the favourable conditions for them to germinate and put out a little hyphae. And that's not very good. So that's the time if you're growing outdoors in those conditions, you really, really want fungus resistant genetics. And it works good. Actually, while we're on the topic, fungus resistant genetics is what I've had for a couple of years now. And the, you've still got, you're still not sweet with that because the dead tissue will allow those spores to germinate because it's, you've only got a resistance on the living tissue. So, for instance, in my well, pink death bubba, it's once all the older leaves, because you know, leaves only last oh, 45 odd days in cannabis and then they'll expire. And because the larger leaves, it's that's where there's a source and a sink method. So they'll go to the sink with the big leaves and then the other um, uh, other processes in the plant will source their nutrients so they'll pull them back out. So you want to get rid of all of the dead tissue because that's will germinate because I was amazed because I was just going through it and thought, oh, look at that. That's interesting, but it's still, I'm still getting botrytis, for instance, and um, but it's not growing on the life plant. Uh, cheers. Excellent. Nice to help, mate. Oh, here we go. Would a fungal dominant foliar spray defend other from other fungi? Would a fungal dominant foliar spray defend from other fungi? Yes. 
what he's saying is if I if he goes and sprays fungal dominance, some trichoderma, um, say trichoderma hazarium, which is a species that I use from the genus trichoderma, and that's a fungal variety, and I'll foliar spray that on the leaves, and I'll do that, well, I reckon at least five times a week. So that builds up a more of a colony for them to establish, so it's not virgin ground, if you want to call it that. So that if something bad moves in, it's got a high chance that it's not going to establish itself. That's why those people that grow in the sterile conditions, it's more difficult than growing in organic conditions for that reason. You have to watch everything. It's so full on. So, yeah, wood fungal dominant foliar spray defend from other fungi. Uh, it will, but you've got to remember too, what, what fungus germinates at what activity water level? So if you've got it once, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, actually that's a yeast, but it's still a fungus under the category, um, that's 65% that germinates at. So if you get, say, 70% humidity, You've got already Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which has already germinated and sprouted, where these ones who germinate at 70 and 75%, they mightn't have actually had a chance to germinate yet. So let's uh, can take that into consideration too, mate. It's hard, this stuff, isn't it? Uh, not really. You just let, I like to let Mother Nature take care of itself and really prepare the substrates and those types of things before it, get a lot of beneficials, all that sort of stuff. And then, um, so when problems do happen, it's a lot easier to take care of. What's GMF say? Yeah, the yeah, given conditions like things like black mold will grow on stainless steel and plastic. Yes, that's remember. Um, e. coli can get around the earth in four thousand forty-eight hours. It can cover the earth four thousand times from in its right conditions. On leather too, can't forget. <laughs> Dealing with a few black mold spots on my car, leather seats after some moisture got in, sucks. Yes, so if you were to reduce that moisture down, you won't get any mold. That's why I don't agree with the vapor, vapor pressure deficit, because that says that you should get into 75% humidity. And wow, okay, I don't. Hey, there's a thumbs up or an okay thing to say. I think he's satisfied. Good stuff. Yes. Well, if anybody's got any more questions, please throw them out. And I can say down the bottom, there's that little thing, that um, cash button down the bottom. If anyone wants to donate, they're more than welcome to. I've got a subscription thing too. Thank you for the people that do that. And that comes at various tiers. To, it depends what you want to get out of it. Um, you can read up then. I'm not going to say it. I've got to mention those things though. I don't usually mention that. <laughs> uh, and next week again, it'll be an open topic. So I think I'll give it 30 seconds. And if no messages come through, I think I'll um, I'll call it, I reckon. Because I'm going to wait for the 30 second delay. All right, so it's, there you go. I'm counting. I see a little clock timer. It's gone to the top. Uh, have a question. How low of a temperature can I use to decarb? It goes on that um, to decarb. So you'd want a secondary metabolite chart, and then in that we'd want to find the ranges that the cannabinoids went in between. So I'll see if I can show a slide to answer your question for you, my friend. So if you want to decarb, TH, this is, it's still got its acid form in it. So I see out here the THCA, its range is between 60 and 120 Celsius, or urine states. So it ranges between 140F and 257F. So if you were to go in those ranges, it's sweet by the look of that. Its boiling point is when it's 
when you take THC, well, this is the decarbing range because this is where you're changing. You want to drop this acid molecule off so it can go into the psychoactive THC. So if you were, what's the lowest range? Well, so this, this tells me that if I was at the 140 or 60 Celsius, that should be starting to affect it because you've got to get THC to 155 Celsius or 311 Fahrenheit for it to be volatilized off like vaporizer in a vaporizer and then that will give you the effects of THC. So if I was to get THCA up to 60 Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit in a pot on the stove, uh, that means that it has a chance where it's going to change because it's reactive in this range. And CBD is a little bit higher again. This is a smidgen higher. So if you've, you know, you've got a lot of CBD in your plant and CBC goes up a heaps more. So do you want to, it's a boiling point. So you have to boil it. So to do its acid conversion, there you go, it says underneath. There you go, mate. Wait, that helps. Uh, Pratel Medical says, hand, purple, blue, peace. Oh, it must be a smiley face or something. Cheers. <laughs> no worries, mate. Glad to help. GMF says, I have a bunch of tincture that needs to be activated and reduced, but I want to know, want to use low temperature to preserve it as much as possible. Time is no object. Well done. Because you know by sticking to that low temperature too is the terpenes profile. And remember, OC mean and is it CB? CBG, yes, CBG and OC mean are reactive at 60 Celsius or 140 Fahrenheit. So if you were to decarb at 60, there's a ch high chance you'll lose OC mean and your CBG. Uh, okay, I can, GMF says, okay, I can do an 80 Celsius water bath. Now the question is how long at low temperature? Oh. He makes a pretty good point, doesn't he? Um, that's, well, I know how, I know this is going to be great, you beauty. I'll bring up this, this slide again. You're going to do a little test for me, mate, and let us all know. And you can do it quite easily. No, that's not what I want to do. Share screen, come on. Share screen. So in here, at the dispensaries and stuff like that, they've got little THC meters where you can, you want to know, does your, or CBC, CBD meters, where it's like a tender little swab thing where you can put this liquid or something on it and it'll react if it's got THC or CBD in it. Grab one, do it, test it with the pre as what has acid in it, and then it should come up no THC, I hope. And then you would go and decarb it at different temperatures and then test it again, and then it should have decarbed and be reactive then. And you can do it with CBD. You can go to CBD tester and test the same on CBD and a THC tester and do the same with that on those little card strips. And then you can get back to me, please, because I'd really be keen to know. And a guess... Uh, what do you think? You're more into the cooking stuff. I'd say it's got to be boiling for at least, this is, it's changing a molecule. So it's not a big clump of chicken. So I'd say, what, 60, 90, 60 or 90 seconds? Because it's only trying to change all the molecules. As long as each one of the molecules inside of it, it has a, the temperature has diffused to each part of the saucepan at that 60 or 65 Celsius, I'd say, I'd do it 70, just to make sure. But in, anyway, you can do the test. You might be able to do it 55, and then it's gonna show up on the, as a THC positive. That's a cool little um, experiment, mate. Yeah, what's it say now? Okay, if we do 60 Celsius, how long? How much time does that 20 Celsius change the time required? Yes, I think it would too. It definitely changed the time because it would go, uh, it would be a lot faster 
if it was say 100 Celsius and if it was at 60 Celsius, it would be a lot slower. So, but yeah, at a guess, being the molecules, you want just to get them to vibrate, to get to that temperature, and then they're going to start and reduce the acid molecule off it. I reckon, I reckon it's only a short time, but again, you can do the test, mate, and get back to us. Yeah, that would be a cool test. What do you think about that one? Hey, Stony Creek, nice to see you, mate. Our dispensaries don't have decarb testing strips. No, they're not decarb testing strips. They're for people that have, um, who buy THC products and they get, they've got a job where they get THC tested. So they've, oh, I've never had one. So I, I can't speak, but they've, I'm just speaking of what they are. Um, maybe not the dispensaries then, but you can say that you've got a, if you work in the mines and you need a THC tester, but you don't want it to be blood or urine, you just want a water-based tester. And they've got them for, for the products, the edibles. Yeah, that's what it's for, the edible range. So for people that have edibles and they don't want any THC in it, they'll put these edibles and soak them in like a cup of water, for instance, and then maybe sw put the swab into it, at a guess. But yeah, you'll have to look into that one for the testers. So sorry, I was bummed to you just saying dispensaries. Stony Creek safe. Yep. The hotter, the faster. Yep. I reckon it is too, mate. Otherwise, at room temperature, it's constantly converting very, very slowly. Yes. Good point, Stony Creek. That's why uh, THC turns into uh, CBN over three months period for that reason, because it's slowly decarbing. Yes. Good on you, Stony, chipping in and helping us not knowing the conversation. <laughs> Good on you, mate. Um, yes, I don't know about that, Jim. If you have to try and have a look around to see maybe online to see how do I test my edibles for THC might be a good um, sentence to put into your search engine. Uh, decarbing. I've heard this somewhere. Oh, yeah. That's Tony. Oh, he's talking to Tony. No worries. That's cool. All right. Well, that's been good. This has been a good... Um, I probably might throw in decarbing at the end. Yeah, good idea. Thanks, GMF. Yeah, at least we can prove it. By proving it ourselves too, it won't be bro science or it won't be other people doing the experiments. We'll know for a fact. So if we can get these little cheap testers and then do our own little tests, we just know then. Cool. And it's for the stuff I have. It works for me at this. Nice one. So I can retitle shows today was organics versus conventional growing and then the different nutrient and second medium metabolite value, how it's a lot better. And then I might put in at the end um, this decarbing or safe decarbing or what could you call it? Healthy decarbing. There's a good word, healthy, because you're trying to maintain all the secondary metabolites by doing it at the lower temperature. Yes, healthy decarbing. Good on you, GMF. Nice words, mate. You pulled it out of me. <laughs> An hour and a half. Cranking. This is good. All right. Well, I don't have much more to say, I think. I appreciate everybody rocking up and putting their two bob in, keeping it all real. It's really nice. And I'll be doing it all the same again for you next week in 167 odd hours. I'll be back here. I'll be back and doing it again. Um, so thanks, everybody. And I hope you have a really nice week. So happy breeding, happy growing, and good health to you all. Bye-bye.